I know, I mean, not to speak for Lisanne and Hani, but you were very trepidatious about entering into this exhibition versus the next one, only because <laughs> you feel like you've moved from the virtual New York Stock Exchange mm -hmm. to buildings. And I mean, I just wonder, given what's happened in the last 15 years, is there more or less need for some kind of civic, or I mean, sorry, that's such a banal term, but some collective architectural response to what's going on. And, and I think Molly's question is really interesting about this whole maker culture. Mm. Like what, not so much how do you enter into that? Mm. Like how do you get a piece of that action? Mm. But more so, what's the response to that new paradigm, which is very different than the New York Stock Exchange, which is a kind of big blue chip, massive global, you know, need for a virtual representation. You know, now what does that do? And, and how do you guys think about that and work now in terms of responding to, to contemporary culture? Because you guys are always thinking about culture. Mm. Go ahead. <laughs> um, are you sure you don't want to take No. Uh, no, I think the, uh, I mean, I think one of the reasons the trepidation was, um, and, and still to some extent is, is that. Was that, you know, what, what you're, what, at least from our perspective, what you're seeing in our particular room, our particular work, you have to contextualize what was really going on in terms of us, okay? So you, we, were, you, we were, what, 26, 27, 28 years old, um, doing a lot of experimentation, um, had no disposable, no income whatsoever, <laughs> and we're working in a kind of radical place, and we were enjoying every minute of it. We didn't really, you know, that's why I said earlier that there is a need now for the arms to be taken up, but by a young generation that in fact has that kind of freedom and time and space to operate within those territories. And what I'm kind of shocked about in the architectural, let's say, if you look on the kind of, uh, in terms of the architectural sort of um, uh, spaces within a Facebook world or within a kind of chat room or within sort of, even within the students, um, is that there is a space and time to take that on at a, at a certain age in this profession. Uh, it's kind of what, what we have done is we took most of that experimentation and radical work that we had done, it's not that we had stopped doing it or stopped thinking about it, but we've funneled it into a, a, you know, a practice now that in fact is, um, has to run, has to pay bills, has, to, has overhead, has, you know, we're, we're in that world, right, of, of, of actually making large buildings and, and master plans and, and other things. So I think that um, you know, there's a part of me listening to you guys and feeling nostalgic up here and uh, <laughs> coming to the show where, yeah, hey, you know what? I'm going to close down the office tomorrow and spend the, ne <laughs> the next, you know, and just get right back into this stuff because it really needs to be done. I agree, but that's not very realistic, right? What's realistic is that there's a, there's a group somewhere out there, and that's why I'm saying it's a kind of lull before the storm because sooner or later, I think, there will be radical, and I'm looking, I'm waiting for them, I'm, I'm anxious to see it, um, sort of, you know, Versatile, agile, younger, um, very smart, very savvy, knowledgeable um, groups or enterprises that will take up arms, and, and we will see some pretty interesting stuff. Um, you know, I was thinking, by the way, going to your studio in Rotterdam, where you were in Rotterdam, right, at the time, and I, I bumped into you, and I remember two vivid things about your studio. One was that ashtray of cigarette butts. Huh? <laughs> you had so uh, many cigarettes. That was. Yeah, really long, long time ago. Okay. The <laughs> other was the project you showed me on the boards. And the project you showed me on the boards, only recently we were, we were confronted by a client. We have a client that we're working with on the West Coast um, who came to us with a project that I said, wait a minute, I've seen this project before. It was your, you know, you 15 years ago, right, around the time, just after you did this. <laughs> you were doing, if you remember, at least the way you explained it to me in the studio, um, basically 3D, 3D printed or 3D manufactured houses that were malleable according to criteria. And you explained to me that if a family was a two, you know, two person family that had a child, the architecture could in fact, right, you would actually shift the mechanism of making those objects and you did these beautiful drawings. Um, and there you were in this world of basically 3D printed buildings. Uh, but way ahead of the curve by virtue of a kind of um, mm -hmm. radical positioning an understanding of the, te of the techniques that were on the horizon and the methodologies that we could employ and the software that was in your hands. And it's that kind of, let's say, um, that kind of working outside of the horizon beyond 
the, what is today that is in fact the radical work, right? The old, the old definition of the avant-garde, to stand at the edge of the paved road and look at the gravel, right? Um, and that's where many of us were in different, in different parts of this problem. Um, I'm not so sure it's our job. Maybe Carl's still standing on the edge of the paved road. No, but, you know, <laughs> I mean, Hani, I, 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 I got to disagree with you a little bit. I mean, I, I don't think it's a big deal, the disagreement, but if you look at Norman Foster, I mean, I remember when everybody said, you're not going to be able to build these blobby shapes. Like, I regret ever using that word blob, but I remember when everybody said, this is going to be unrealizable, nobody's going to ever pick it up, this is going to be a dead language, and then Peter Pran, and it started to go, and then I saw Norman Foster's Gherkin, I said, whoa, like, that was fast, you know, from British high tech mm -hmm. to that kind of language. Mm -hmm using people, you know, bringing in people. I mean, there's any number of instances mm -hmm. of practices, you know, very mature, large practices, just pivoting and moving in a totally other direction. And I think in response to something, you know, I don't know if it's an internal thing or if it's something in culture that they see an opportunity for, but I mean, if you look at Zaha, Zaha's Hong Kong Peak and what Zaha's doing now, she really pivoted and Patrick really pivoted that practice and, you know, parametricism and that whole model came really out of a lot of stuff that's next door. Um, but so I do think it's, you're, it's possible to pivot a big practice and maybe the whole discipline. Oh, no, for sure. But I guess what I'm driving at, though, is, is a kind of a, um, in that period, there were enough radical uh, there were enough radical, enough radical thinking, enough people working on the margins and the periphery that it kind of funneled and fueled. Now, granted, some of it got commodified pretty fast, commercialized, and trivialized, right? Well, which is what you want. But those, peop those larger practices no? relied on that younger generation and recent graduates experimenting in school. It wasn't coming from inside those organizations. And I think, Hanny, you're partially saying, and we all, you know, we find ourselves saying, is we want to be out ra radicalized by our own students. We don't want to be pulling them along. We would like them to be pushing us the way yeah, yeah. you're describing Foster being, you know, propelled to then kind of re-examine how he would approach something like an yeah. urban tower. Kind of pitch it another way, because it's uh, we we always seem to lapse back into the technical, it's sort of the, the the building of stuff, rather than and we, we don't talk about the organization of how you conceive things and how you do things. What, what intrigued me about the Frankfurt Ballet was he found another mode of collective creativity. Uh, and that's what allowed him to, to produce a, something that was formerly more sophisticated. It wasn't from his mind, it was from a, a networked community. Um, and you know, certainly th there is a revolution sort of going on of of, of network thing, but every time I go into a technical team of people, I was just recently talking to the the guy who built the America's Cup the AC-72 boats, all of the, all of the Oracle boats, and I said to him, you know, so who was the lead architect in this? Who who set the who set the form? And he said, you know, probably this is the first time I've worked on a racing boat where it really was, you know, under the water it was hydro engineers, aero engineers above, structural engineers, whatever, and he said it was a team of people throwing a digital model around and arguing about it, but it was, it was genuinely a, a, a collective, collaborative effort. I, I still don't think we've, we've done very much in architecture to, to begin to address that. And, and probably until we do, until we, we figure a, a new protocol of working other than the kind of pyramidal offices that we, we still all inhabit, then we're, we're unlikely to, to make great inroads into the, the formal because we need the expertise of the roboticists and the program and everyone, but as equals. You can't, you can't subjugate them to your vision. That's, my, that's been my lesson of yeah, things like hypersurface. The corollary to that or the, the, <coughs> is the fact that then the architect, that's what I said earlier about being neutered, right? To sit that's in a right. room full that's of experts. Right. So when we did the Yaz Hotel, okay, we, we were sitting in a room in Frankfurt at the at, um, Wagner Bureau. We had uh, 26 different engineers in the room. Uh, we had a problem because the client didn't want to build it at that price and, and, and that complexity. Um, and everybody from Gary Tech to our guys to Schlei Bergemann to Wagner Bureau, all these guys, we had to basically pool together and figure out very fast how to create an organizational system That's to get right. that thing done 
pat to, how, to, how to get it done within the budget, within the timeline needed. But at the end of the day, that client turned to me, right, because I was the architect in the room, and said, so can you do it? You know, now that we've heard from all these guys, are you going to be, are you going to do this? Said no. <laughs> I said, no way. <laughs> Two domes, it'll be over. No, no, no one, but, no one, but the no point one is, I think, I think we've got to be careful. What I said earlier about, you know, I think the question you asked earlier was super profound in terms of why has a certain kind of research stopped, right? And why has the profession kind of moved into a sort of, into a strange lull, right? Whether, whether you know, I think it's in a kind of strange lull. It's hard for me today to look through umpteen disease pages and see something really amazing. Right? Mm -hmm. All I see is the same thing over and over again, and we're part of that problem. Well, so, it's architecture doesn't go very well with the super amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're our own worst enemies, amazing. I'm telling you. No, it's like 99% of architecture does normal. Mm. It sort of takes care of the normal. I don't want to be the high decker in here, but Jesus, that's, just look around you. Just look, Okay. Yeah, but then why, but then let me, let me interview you. Why did you do what you did? Why did you do the water pavilion? Well, the, no, no, that's not the question. I think I explained that very well. <laughs> why didn't I have a decent job afterwards? <laughs> 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 because because we built one of them, but it's not like the whole world is asking for these hyper experiential, floorless, ceilingless wall as buildings because it, it was like so extreme it's like the sliders like on one end mm -hmm. and then the question is okay we do schools and we do like bed we need a bedroom we need a boardroom what do you do with this stuff so we never got those clients we were like immediately expelled by our own work do you know the famous story of, of frederick Kiesler flying out to the west coast uh, with, with his first big client do you know that story he got a very big job in the West Coast. He flew out. It reminds me of your story exactly. He flew out there. He was wined and dined by these, this very, very wealthy client. And they said, tomorrow morning, we'll show you where we're going to put your endless house. Um, and so the next morning, he gets up. He has a breakfast. He's so happy. He goes out to this incredible expanse of land. And he says, where's the site for my house? He goes, well, you're doing endless houses, right? <laughs> we want them everywhere. <laughs> and, he went back to New York so depressed <laughs> and so, you know, feeling so misunderstood. And really, it's a, it's a true, it's an interesting moment in his in his. I don't for counter, counter point, though. I have a student looking at Kurt Schwitters really closely, uh, who, was, who was a nutcase. I mean, he was, he was even thrown out by Dada. He, he was this kind of curious, monk-like character working away at, at himself. Um, but the, the, the sort of thesis is he's, he's exemplary of of an emerging sort of creative autobiography, she calls it, of, of the, the desire of any kind of intelligent person to, to be constantly engaged in, in redoing and rethinking and advancing them, themselves. And so I ended up, you know, as a professor sort of saying, well, okay, so what's the legacy of this? And she said, well, can you name me an architect who's not in that mode now? Any famous sort of contemporary architect? Mm -hmm. And she said, Tom Main, Schwitterite, perfectly Schwitterite. You know, he's living in his Mertzbau. If you visit his office, it's literally the Mertzbau. You know, and he's, and he's constantly pushing for the next and the next and the next as his mode of being. And so, you know, from, from a, a radical outsider like L L Lars doing his water pavilion, uh, how many years later is it that he's the, you've got the Pritzker Prize, the institutionalization of this praxis? You know, so I, 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 I think, I think it's, it's, there's a danger to sort of say that this won't be, be normative. I mean, the, the purely experiential seems to be, in fact, what, what's going on. You know, as we're moving, we all sit in our beds at night and watch movies all the time. And, you know, so it's, it's a pure you know, pleasure and pain of the axes. It's not, it's not kind of, you know, right and wrong any, any longer. We're, we're in a mode of, 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 uh, of consumption and of experience that is, you know, still just, just getting going, in my opinion. So, uh, you know, we may well be an experiential pleasure palace. I guess I'm the only one here that's here for historical reasons, because I really <laughs> didn't want to be in the show. Yeah, it's true. We really had to push your arm. I stopped doing architecture, yeah. and, um, and I thought, like, well, at first it's great to see your old friends, but it's, it's also like a very old project to me. Yeah. And I thought, it's very good that it's taken care of, of for historical reasons, not for contemporary reasons. Yeah. 
So my agenda is not like being contemporary or new. I just go nuts when I hear the word new, new world. I just want to hit you. I mean, <laughs> man, I just want to throw this thing at you. And a, a brave new world too. I'm sorry? S this cyber religious crap. I mean, I'm happy that it's history. I'm happy it's history and that it's there and that it can inspire new people. And, and, but for me, I don't put any claim on the future. I just... See, that's the difference between America and Europe. <laughs> <laughs> he's in Atlanta. Yeah, he, he's from, oh, now he's well, it's also, the reason, right? <laughs> it's also the reason I built that thing, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think, uh, um, let's put it this way. It's not so much about what you want you to do, op opera, sci-fi stuff. And that, uh, some of my friends are doing that now. I think if we look at the structure of time, right, not in the, kind of the Western concept of a linear unfolding of time, history, but at every moment, and this is a philosophical proposition, here, at every present now is situated at the intersection of possible past and possible future. So for me, to come up with a proactive proposition for a future as opposed to a retroactive Colossian, I'm sorry to use this name, of looking back and appropriating it and bringing it back to the present with no future to it, to the, to the project, is an unethical position to take. And so I'm completely disagreeing with you on the on ethical basis. And this is an ethical proposition about utopic aspiration for architecture. About it has, it's directed towards possible futures. And that, my friend, is America. <laughs> Well, <laughs> okay, so I'm not defending Reagan or anyone like that, but just the utopian spirit. No, no, it's, it's, there's a reason that a lot of historians are, are upset about this whole archaeologies of the digital project, because the, the historical method would say, you can't write the history 20 years after the thing. You know, you should wait 40, 50, longer. Yeah. That helps. Yeah, that I think I think any historian would say that a dead topic is better than a live topic. Yeah. Definitely more more cooperative. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but so, so what's but, it, what's, but, it, what's in the water? No, no. But, <laughs> but, but no. Here's here's the thing. If we waited forty or fifty years, you know, your sister would have thrown that stuff out. And Absolutely. you guys would, you know, would have packed up those boxes in the next move of the office. And, and so we really needed to, that's why it's the archaeology, we needed to capture this stuff. And you're right, time show. is compressed now. It's the few, the, you're right, yeah. Yeah. it's a good, good moment. Yeah. But I mean, that, that is where I got interested because we have been, I think all of us have been struggling for 20 years to find decent critics. Yeah. To actually look at what we're doing on the screen and to understand what we're doing and to explain it in a large... We, we, I mean, the generation before us already had to write their own books and philosophies and, and, and criticisms, but now we, we really have to write our own stuff. See, the right? interesting because thing about this... No Aaron Betsky, no whoever, right. uh, Andreas Ruby will write ever any proper text or book. About, so you get like the coffee books the coffee table books, but no, no proper critical appreciation of, of what, the, what we've been doing. So I got really interested in the notion that, that a really important architectural institute with a historical, a, a deeply historical notion of architecture is actually doing this show. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking maybe the Picons and the Carpos actually start to come in now and start to understand what, what we have been doing the last 20 years instead but, of writing all this crap ourselves, that think, they should yeah. take it over. But do you think they really can understand it if they didn't, if well, they didn't do it? You know, because it, it, it's a very, it was a very strange moment to go from how, how you'd learn to do something to sort of plastically adapt yourself to something else. I mean, I remember seeing Greg's work and thinking, oh my God, how do we, how do I... But you find yourself over the next you know, three or four years actually adapting very, very quickly. But it's, it's, it's that weird sort of yearning sense of you've got to find, find a way to engage in this new medium, which I don't think any external critic is, is really going to No, but it. look, 15 years ago, I wasn't anymore with Eisman and, and on the same panel, remember? And he said something, and there's one Italian guy standing up and another Italian guy, and he had it all organized. 
uh, right? That he always trained the critics, right? So he would yeah. send a text out, he would like email them around, and they would know what, what the argument was, and, and, and he would train them. It was like a machine. Mm -hmm. We have never been able to do that. N no Bart loads my, I lost Bart let, like <laughs> over 10 years ago. Ruby, I, I put like a, a whole year of effort in. <laughs> and I could like give you a whole list of critics. I tried to train, but it was just impossible. Right? It was just impossible. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that really is on a happened on a larger scale. But when so you say train, you're not talking about... Tell them what to write. <laughs> 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 I mean, we've tried and we've been in these fabulous... They're, yeah, they're, I mean, for architects, I mean, there was, that's why you Because you're talking about two I different mean, things. Like any, how Rem and Peter organized that machine, right, to take power. That was incredible. We've never been really able but to do we, that. Weren't we sort of... I, totally right, failed. From where we sat, we were nauseous by that. We, yeah, we, we wanted, we, we opposed that. I think one of the things that's interesting is... It's, we're all part of it. No, but what's interesting mm. about you saying, look, you stopped, uh, this, is a, this is basically a dead project that has been archived. And we feel the same way, quite frankly. The New York Stock Exchange project and that entire time when we were working in VR and all those, those environments, all that work, that's a package box. It's dead. That, that Hanny and Lizanne who work on that, they're no longer around, right? It's a... No, it's fine. And it can be analyzed that way, and it's, it's completely true. But one of the things that's interesting is, what's interesting about you know, the CCA's issue with these things technologically, the obsolescence of machines, the digitizing of VHS tapes, the, 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 the sort of the way everything else is going obsolete, is we're actually in sync, in a strange way, with technological obsolescence, right? We're moving, you know, and when I think, I think the radical in this period, as opposed to the the radical of, of the, even of Tom's Mertzbau world, right, which I, to me is a little bit backward, is this fact that they don't want to be obsolete. There's this fact that they want, they want to stay immortal, they want to continue. Peter tried to throw me off a balcony in New York not so long ago <laughs> because I told him, you're obsolete. He's like, I'm not, what are you talking about? That's why he doesn't speak right? to me as well. And, and, I on the balcony? No, no, but, but I mean, <laughs> you know, here, here I tried to put a call out to the historians and critics, and you say you want to train them, but the reason they don't want to work with living people is because, ironically enough, the living people only want to have them be interested in the thing that they're working on today. Mm -hmm. They don't want them to be interested in the stuff that they did before that they've moved off of. But frankly, the historians and the critics and the theorists, they're going to be interested in whatever they find interesting, and sometimes it's going to not be the thing I mean, look, I don't think you want to do something that everybody's going to think is right while it's on your desk or on your screen. You know, the whole point is you should be far enough ahead of things that, that people are going to not get it. But that's, that's, a, that's a position, and dare I use the word, a, a kind of zeitgeist that's in fact part of this generation. Yeah. We actually, I think, whether we agree on it or not, but we're not, I, I would go crazy if there's six plants in this audience who basically are, are right, I'm telling them what to say about my work, and now they're telling everybody what to think about my work. I, okay, I well, let's I, see if I there's any up. plants. You're right. I'm I'm I got this thing. <laughs> Are there two ferns in the audience? <laughs> Little so internet joke. We were, we're way late, which is good. There's still an audience out there, which is good. But before they abandon us, let's see if there's any questions for the group. A very cynical answer. There's uh, the, the world that arch architecture deals with, money-wise, is let's say architecture. I see as I see it, like technologically, it's at the low end, but the amounts of money we deal with uh -huh. is at the top end, and that's something culturally you always have to bridge. So that the power that architecture needs to 
and force or bring into is to push us from that stage to that level. And, and I think that's the problem. So I'm, I, don't, I never mind to work with artists, but that doesn't bring in clients that want to build larger projects. You know, I don't think that which is a, a, that's a reason. I mean, I mean, she's asking a more conceptual reason than rather than finding the practical reason of money and, and the discipline. Money is culture too. I know, I know, but what I'm saying is that, you know, I deal with a lot of philosophers. When you ask yeah, philosophers to write about architecture, the architecture is so prosaic and normative. Not so they may be very, not all of them, uh, but a lot of philosophers have you know, very deep and profound in, insightful in what they write, right? Maybe within philosophical discourse, but when they talk about architecture, it's relatively banal. Well, lots, so of, lots of great experience. philosophers love the banal and, and the normative. You I know, mean, like Heidegger the, wrote about architecture. No, and, the, the, these are exceptions. And you know, like Lefebvre the, wrote, wrote a lot about architecture, and uh, th there's many more examples. That I don't think that's the issue. I don't think that's the I, issue. You I, know, like I, the I, object only philosophy I, of, of Graham, I mean, Harman, Graham Harman. We invited him to Pratt. He was on the review. He was silent. Nothing to say. Okay, why have we, as a, suppose we're a group, right? So that, that it was sort of radical architecture group. Why have we never got a normal project, like a little primary school or, it's always like really? a, a, no, an, a op it's always an right. opera in bloody China right. or Kazakhstan, places Somebody where you don't want to be, like to give Lars a primary and clients school. you don't want to have. <laughs> I can tell you the stories about the clients I had that all ran away at a certain point, but <laughs> they were so ultra weird. <laughs> so the you money level, the cultural level, was so beyond anything, right? No, pro I know. Like, I was taught a lot of money, for God's sake, and it, and he was building schools, and we never got like onto that normal level of producing building. No, it's no, always immediately on this. You can't have it both ways. Well, are there any normal corporate school building practices on the stage or in the CCA's wow. permanent collection? That's not the world we're interested in. Obviously. Well, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but that I think is a problem. Why? No, I mean I, I think yes. If if there are, I, you welcome that exchange, of course. I mean it's wonderful. I, um, I've I've been having a lot of dealings with Greg Ulmer, who's a cultural theorist. He's, He's, he doesn't understand much about architecture, but his son, his son went through architecture school, so he, he's a quick study. And amazing how, how and, and I love the framing he brings. It's very different, very refreshing. The, uh, and as for the normal projects, we're doing mass housing now. I, I mean, I actually see that there is a segue from this stuff into uh, methods of production, but it's more like you're, you're setting up the rules of the game to hand off rather than actually you know, doing the housing yourself. But, so I add, may I add? I don't know if I am a rescue or uh, I'm very sorry to, to interrupt uh, the discussion in a moment that uh, was starting to become uh, really interesting, open up uh, different questions. Um, uh, that is exactly what uh, we want you to do. In a certain way, uh, the objective of this uh, series of projects related to archaeology of the digital is in a certain way try to um, abandon the narrative that has been already built. And I'm sorry to say, Lars, because uh, I am very sympathetic with what you said uh, uh, for all the evening, but I'm not, uh, I don't agree with you. The, the history and the critic uh, have already built a very precise narrative about uh, that moment and that period. Mm -hmm. It's a narrative that I think uh, is uh, not um, really capturing uh, a lot of um, interesting points that uh, uh, have been raised uh, in that period. And uh, it's, it's a narrative that has reduced everything inside an architectural uh, history, an architectural criticism, and I feel that, uh, on the contrary, this um, architecture, an interesting thing, an interesting story and narrative that has to be perhaps told is that to put architecture inside a larger narrative in that moment. The reason that we also 
went to the idea of archaeologists uh, uh, echoing media archaeologists because I think it could be for me, for us, could be very interesting to see how this kind of research, experimentation, failure, success, they could uh, be put nearby other kind of, uh, uh, let's say, media archaeology history that uh, are going, or narrative that are built today in a very different way, you know, from uh, you, you, the Anglo-Saxon to the German to the Finnish. Uh, there are so many different kind of archaeology, also like uh, so many different kind of uh, histories that you can build. But uh, I think that that could be for us, uh, so this effort to dismantle a, an existing narrative mm -hmm. uh, was for us a really an objective of this kind of project. And uh, a way also, and in this sense, uh, Lars, I agree with you, is uh, the problem for us uh, was uh, to dismantle this, but uh, with a precise knowledge of the process and of the practice and uh, of the tools and uh, of the know-how that has been put in place in that uh, moment. And that was the reason that uh, I would like to thank all of you because uh, uh, you helped us a lot in order to access and to understand from the inside the way that uh, this material uh, has been uh, created, manipulated, transformed. Otherwise, uh, we would have done exactly the same thing that uh, most of the people have done uh, till now, looking from the outside at uh, this kind uh, of um, uh, production, let's call it in this way. Um, and uh, uh, I feel that we were missing one of the most important things, that it was a total transformation in the process, a total transformation in the tools, a total transformation that you know very well that that means a total different way of thinking. And most uh, of the narrative till now built uh, about that kind of thing was looking at the result, but uh, not able to capture from this side this kind of thing. I just, so that is the intention. I don't know if uh, we have been able uh, to capture completely this and to represent that uh, in, uh, the, in the exhibition, in the kind of uh, publication that we are doing. But that is uh, the objective of this kind of, uh, of a project. Uh, there is also a, a kind of observation that I'd like to make in compar comparing the first um, of this exhibition uh, related to um, Eisenman, uh, uh, Frank Gehry, uh, Shoyo, and uh, Chuck Oberman, in which uh, I think the interesting point uh, coming out from uh, Greg uh, observation working on that exhibition is that in reality, this group of architects was uh, l looking for tools to represent something that it was very clear already in their vision. And I feel that the big difference between uh, that kind of, uh, how can I say, uh, uh, experiment, this kind of uh, strategy, and what uh, we, have, we are seeing in this kind of exhibition is a total different uh, change, is uh, much more experimental. It's not uh, an effort to look for tools for something that you have uh, already in mind, but is uh, a search that uh, is uh, uh, embedded in the use of these different tools. So I think there is an incredible shift, which is not a formal, it's not a power game, it's not a, a formal search, it's not kind of thing, it's a totally conceptual, uh, different kind of set of rules on the base of which uh, you have been operating. So, uh, yeah. that uh, is, uh, uh, I had to say something just to close uh, in uh, <laughs> this kind of, uh, and, uh, uh, and not uh, just uh, saying to you, see you in a few months here again when there will be a new exhibition. I think that uh, this is again for us an uh, ongoing process. Uh, there will be other kind of seminars, publication, discussion, events in the next uh, year, in the next years. Uh, I just uh, uh, invite you not uh, to CCA again uh, to the next exhibition, but uh, to in Venice, when uh, there will be another discussion, mm -hmm. I think that will go on. Again, something that is mentioned before, again, uh, um, 
we are present at the Swiss Pavilion in Venice Biennale with uh, the uh, Seri Price archive, and I think that will be another opportunity for another kind of critical discussion, or I hope uh, reopening a kind of discussion, not on the same page, but in a certain way on uh, a different kind uh, of uh, issues, but uh, I think there will be some similarities in uh, the critical attitude could be developed in respect to the uh, thinking of architecture in, uh, for the 21st century. And again, in Venice, uh, you are clearly, I hope that uh, you can make that. Uh, uh, we cannot give you a grant for that, but anyway. Uh, uh, there will be uh, something that for us is very important. Uh, there will be the uh, uh, ceremony for the uh, Golden Lion, and I'm very, very happy to, to say that we also will be, all of us will be there, because uh, this year the recipient is Phyllis Lambert, and I think that... Uh, So, uh, Phyllis uh, has been incredible in uh, uh, all uh, her work, uh, in the motivation of uh, RAM, there is a motivation for the Seagram and for the CCA, but I think that uh, uh, it, is, uh, it could have been difficult for all of us, CCA, uh, to do this exhibition and this work without uh, the incredible support of all the architects, and especially of Greg but also without uh, the support of Phyllis that last, let us uh, try things that uh, uh, is very difficult to try in other places and in other institutions. So thank you very much. And thanks to all of you.